Yeah, this is really annoying with Discord. I mean, with, with Twitter spaces just randomly not working. It's so annoying. Thanks, Elon. <sighs> Bro, for real. Why is it broken? I mean, it's already terrible on a day-to-day -day basis, and now it just doesn't work all of a sudden. I know. It's like, it's like a bug fix where you break everything instead of fix it. It's like, yeah, it wasn't perfect, but I, hey, at least it worked. <laughs> yeah, now I feel bad because everyone has to like come into here. Yeah, I think it no has. Like, know. I know. I, th I think the space had probably what, like 100 people that had set reminders. Yeah, 101 people. Yeah, 103 now, dang. Well, hopefully people see it. Not sure what else we can really do. Yeah, that's too bad. So who's psyched about Edge Wallet? Oof. And not Edge Wallet. Well, I'm, I'm also psyched about Edge Wallet, uh, but Trust Wallet. Oh my god. Dude, Trust Wallet. Amazing. It's here. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, when was that first rumored? Like, well over a year ago, right? <laughs> I think there's been, like, on and off discussions for probably about a year is, is kind of how this whole thing happened. And, I mean, they have, like, a pretty, like, solid business, and they have a lot of different things that they're, uh, you know, doing for their users, obviously. So I, I, I think the way it kind of goes, like, they're like, oh, yeah, we're definitely interested. And then, you know, some, some time goes by and then some more time goes by and then, you know, follow up. You know, it, it just takes a while to get this stuff like off the ground, especially with such a big team like they have. So uh, it, it's amazing to finally like see it going and then see the see all the swaps come through. Uh, I mean, that. With just a couple of days of data here, like they're they're doing pretty pretty nice for the uh, for the week, even though it's really only been live for I think two full days now, the fourteenth and the fifteenth. Do you have the stats in front of you? You want to read off anything? What's up, guys? Hey, hey yo, Erdonis. Yeah, speaking of which, I actually, I'm like writing their weekly report right now. I do have the stats in front of me. Um, so they, this week, uh, 336 swaps came through Trust Wallet. Um, they had a refund percentage of 2.3%, which is really good. Um, giving them some recommendations on how they can lower that further. Uh, they did 200K USD in volume, which puts them at the fourth largest affiliate. Uh, ThorSwap is the largest affiliate, then Thor Wallet, then Shapeshift, and then Trust Wallet at this point. Um, so pretty solid. I mean, we, we've, we've been tracking their swaps throughout the week. Um, and, you know, basically the only education they've done is that one tweet. Um, and also users need to, you know, physically update their app to access uh, these swaps. Um, and this is only Android, so they have a whole, you know, you know, millions of other users that are on iOS. Um, so we definitely expect this volume to continue to uptick as more users download the app, as they release it to iOS, and as they kind of roll out some more educational content for their users. Um, and as people get familiar with that these swaps are now, that these kind of cross-chain routes are now available, uh, we expect uh, more more users to keep coming back. And so this, this, we expect this volume to, you know, exponentially increase over the next few months. Absolutely, yeah. For it to be that strong just in the first two, three days with just Android, not everyone updated, no iOS, uh, limited education. I mean, that's a really strong signal that it's going to ramp up quite exponentially once once all those things play out. So that's, yeah, strong. Yep. Yeah, it's been it's been great. And I just love like watching their swaps come through. We had a two Bitcoin to ETH swap uh, this morning. We had the 13 ETH swap a couple of days ago. Um, those are the those are the meaty swaps that we want. So uh, just about to call that out Two Bitcoin swap this morning. Really juicy. <laughs> that's, that's quite quite juicy. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to run the numbers on what the liquidity fee was at for that. Let me pull that one up. It's like 130 rune or something like that. I checked it earlier. Don't, don't worry. Nice. <laughs> yeah, but really, so are you, are you saying that, uh, 
Trust Wallet is now the, the fourth biggest in, in total affiliate volume? Correct. Yep. So there are 10 active affiliates uh, currently. Um, and yeah, Trust Wallet is already the fourth largest. I mean, Thor, ThorSwap, you know, kind of blows everyone away. They're doing 4.8 million uh, in USD volume weekly on average, you know, at this point. Uh, Thor Wallet's doing uh, 350,000 USD. Shapeshift is doing 260,000. And Trust Wallet, uh, 200,000 uh, this, uh, this week, this past week. Um, and we're trying, and we're starting to track, uh, percent of Thor chain volume that is, that comes from affiliates. So basically it's like affiliates are our bots right now. We're at 7.8%, which is relatively low. And like kind of our, one of our KPIs is to basically increase that percentage as much as possible, just so that more of the volume on Thor chain is actual users and not our bots. But what is interesting is that 23% of liquidity fees, basically 23% of yield that's going to the LPs is from, uh, is from affiliates um, and not our bots, which is, which is pretty solid. Um, and so, you know, again, those are the two pretty important KPIs. If we can get, you know, 200% of swap fees coming from affiliates, then as block rewards continue to decrease, the yield will not be impacted. And uh, you know, the reserve will, uh, you know, have a constant kind of revenue stream. So that's, that's kind of what our, our, uh, you know, long-term goal is. And that's before iOS is even released for Trust Wallet, which, it, and before anyone really even knows that Thorchain is, is in there, like, as you said, they only did very small amount of promotion and we're already seeing this, you know, pretty, pretty good, volume it's decent volume for sure and there there's swaps coming in every you know every couple of minutes basically uh so i mean that's looking super positive right there and it sends a signal to a lot of the rest of the industry i think just just showing how reliable thorchain is and then you know that that it is reliable infrastructure there to use and have power to swap so like not not only is this reached a huge amount of users but it just puts it just puts thorchain in that in that context of like, hey, this is the this is the industry swap provider, right? And it'll just make it easier to do future integrations, and uh, especially once it gets to iOS and this like it proliferates more, people become more used to the flow of, of swapping. Uh, it's really smooth swapping in, in TrustWall. They they really nailed down the, the user experience. So it's like lo- yeah. long time coming, but you guys yeah. did it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so bullish on uh, just trust UI UX understanding. I mean, I think that's such a key reason why they've got the market share that they do. Um, and now, like, even releasing the, the browser extension, hopefully we see more chains added on that side and and, and even swap functionality there, too. I'm, I'm sure that's pretty likely. But even, even their extension, it just comes out day one, polished, things work well. Clearly, they they know what they're doing, and that's actually still kind of rare when it comes to UI UX in in this industry. You know, so it makes me really excited. Yeah, yeah, one of the smart things I think Trust Wallet did was uh, so first off, they're well, they do have BUSD as as a, as a swap option, obviously through through Thorchain, but the other swap routes like BTC to ETH, for example, you don't actually see a dollar quote anywhere in there. Like you don't see that you're putting in. $17,000 worth of Bitcoin and getting out 16.9 of ETH. It's just a, uh, a conversion rate, basically. Like they, they don't, um, they, they don't, they, they kind of abstract all that away from, from the users and just make it just the, the simplest swap flow possible, which is like, like to me, that seems really positive because it, it especially when you when it's not a because they, they're just doing it in the amounts that you're actually swapping it in so you're um you're abstracting away the the, the dollar amounts from it which i think is the right way to do a swap that, that's what every other swap swap platform does right it's not like oh the, uh this is this is how much fees are being charged all, all, all fees are just abstracted away into the you know into the exchange rate on most of these exchanges which is uh, kind of the way that that trust wallet presents the the, the trade to the user, which I think is, uh, you know, it just prompts more people to swap and just say like, yeah, this this is the exchange rate for Bitcoin ETH because it really is the only swap route. So that's the way that people are gonna end up taking. 
rather than really be like, oh, uh, I'm losing a couple dollars of value here swapping, so maybe I'll just stick with it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Instead of breaking down every fee, every all, all slippage, all that, just saying like, hey, here's the rate. It actually makes me think of like, you know, uh, just like using Coinbase or something, like what most normies are used to. It's like if you go to sell some Bitcoin, it's just like, well, you're going to get 16500 And it's like, wait, the price just said 16900 Like, Like, what's happening? It doesn't, it doesn't actually break down that fee. It's just like, it just presents it. Here's the rate. So that's kind of seems similar to just like abstract all that away that's interesting i didn't i didn't actually notice that that's a good point though yeah and the, the other thing uh that makes me bullish on trust wallet volume is you know now that now that the discussion of adding bnb chain is kind of ramping up and we're kind of in a prime position to do that i mean nodes have voted that that's the next chain they want and i would almost expect Binance, BNB chain or Binance Smart Chain volume on Trust Wallet to be higher than Beacon Chain volume, um, just because it's kind of more popular in DeFi. There's probably more activity, um, and so we kind of already have a built-in, you know, volume stream for that chain. Unlike you know, kind of like Avax that we added and we, we didn't really have that. So I think you know, in in the early new year, if we add that, I think that's gonna you know be another catalyst for greater volume through through, through Trust Wallet and. Potentially, I could see them rivaling ThorSwap, you know, relatively soon. So that would be great. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like, I don't even know where you can get BEP two assets. I mean, maybe there's somewhere, some exchange that does it. There's no Dex that does it anymore. Now that Binance Dex is uh, kind of out the window there, uh, mm-hmm. and e- everyone that's using Trust Wallet is using uh, Binance Smart Chain assets. So. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, in my, in my opinion, now's the time to really get that going, get get the aggregator going, and then that's when you're going to see crazy amounts of of, uh, of volume coming through, especially especially trust wallet. But that just opens up all these other routes too that people are really trying to trade. Aggregator, yeah, you might have you might have just dropped some alpha in there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's even alpha at this point. Like we've been saying it for like like eight months now. I think. Maybe it is alpha to the people who just like have no idea. It's definitely not alpha to anyone in this Discord. So you guys know who you are, the aggregators out there. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we can kind of assume that the aggregator pattern is going to continue to uh, proliferate. I mean, it's just kind of a no brainer for these wallets that are already kind of interacting with the Thorchain network. It's just kind of a tacking on an additional smart contract call and opens up their users to thousands and thousands of cross-chain routes that no one else has. I mean, it's just an absolute no-brainer. Yeah, and like going along with the the Trust Wallet integration, like the aggregator is the, um, is like ultimately like where the goal should be. Like the, like the goal isn't just to get the, the major layer one swaps there, is to get, make it so you can trade anything through any of these apps, Trust Wallet, Edge, Thor swap, whatever, using the aggregator and it just roots to Thor chain, roots to all the other DEXs, abstracts it away from the user. And then, you know, user can just use their wallet and swap easily, not to go to a, a DAP or a DEX or an aggregator or anything like that, all just taken care of for them. And that's just ha- how simple it's going to be. That That's the the true evolution of the, the trust wallet integration. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm just so excited hearing that like the tune kind of changed pretty quickly around bsc with this integration because what just a week or two ago we were kind of saying like it's not really new chain time you know it's going to add cost to to nodes it's unproven and like while that makes a lot of logical sense it was also kind of a dis- disappointing thing to hear and uh yeah i know i'm excited i i feel like the the community is just going to be super stoked to get to get a high volume chain in there and especially one that like like you said already has like we know there's going to be volume, so it's win-win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think I think the volume that will come from BNB chain will will you know hopefully offset the cost, the additional cost of the validators. It might you know might take a few months because yeah, we're we are in like a deep bear market, and that's the other thing is like. You know, we are we are like in a very kind of tough spot, like economically speaking, in the space. And the Thorchain volume has really held up, like relatively compared to other dexes. I mean, you've we, we've seen like volume like decrease ninety percent. You know, in most dexes, uh, you know, across the space in the last you know five to six months. 
and Thorchain actually has done relatively better than that. Um, and so as we land these integrations at the bottom, and as like dominoes continue to fall, I mean, TrustWall is a massive domino, and we have already our sites scoped on you know, the next four wallets that we're going, going after. So we get that done, we get BNB chain added, maybe we get Dash added, and we're going to be just set up like in a great position for the next uptick. So I'm just super pumped for that. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm super pumped. We, we have some big conversations happening with some big wallets out there, as Eridanus knows. And uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things to feel very bullish on, you know, and, and a lot of those conversations are going rather well, too. So it's there's so much so much going on that I, I, I really can't even contain myself. <laughs> yeah, it really is like integration domino season. I mean, of course, you guys at Nine Realms are are working so hard on that, and um, I'm seeing it on the on the Thor Swap side too with the Thor Swap API. Like, just the flow of how many conversations are happening these days, it's like crazy. It feels like every day or two, there's another conversation opening up with a name I didn't expect to see, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's just so exciting. Absolutely. And now, now is the time to like double, double down, dial in, like not get complacent. You know, we're, 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 we're going to push harder than we ever have and just land these, land these integrations. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just psyched. One of the fascinating things we, we recently been seeing on the integration side is that like, we've had some um, wallets or whatnot come up to us and say, Hey, we heard of the savers concept, like, how do we integrate with savers and offer that to our, you know, to our customers, our clients or whatever. And they had like, sometimes I didn't really uh, know that we did cross chain swap. They were just like, we just, we just want to do the savers thing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Dude. Like there, there's like two camps. Like, like sometimes we'll have like an, in, like a, just kind of a fresh conversation with a wallet and we'll, you know, naturally start with the cross chain swaps. They're like, Oh yeah, that's cool. And then we'll talk about savers and like, oh, that's cool. Like, let's let's do that. So there, there's like, it's interesting. It, like, literally split down the middle. Like, like half wall. It's like, like, like going after the cross chain swaps immediately. Half of them are going after savers immediately, um, which is great. You know, we need both. We want both. So uh, it's just amazing that, like, savers really has like, like caught a lot of attention from from these external teams, which is really cool. Let me just say it, it's so it's so satisfying to see the the product market fit of, of Thorchain right now and how it, it's really just finding its niche like right at this this very critical moment for this you know entire industry and asset class basically how like you know we rolled out Savers which is just one of the, one of the most incredible products which will is really what's going to scale Thorchain's uh tvl and you know, the amount of bitcoin in its pools and then at the same time also like getting all this interest from these wallets who really want to uh integrate the swaps but also savers like it, it really is clear that there's a huge product market fit uh for all of these products that, that the chain is offering and just a, a huge demand to actually like actually integrate them and, and use those infrastructure so it, it's just awesome to see like the acceptance from from the industry and uh, you know, uh, other teams and apps and things like that who just want to use these services, which is why uh, these services are being built in the first place to eventually get to their users. So really cool to see people actually using these and say it's like savers growing so well, but then like the the business development side of everything going so well too. It's like everything, uh, you know, just, just seems like it's clicking for, for a while. Yeah, I think in part because a lot of the services that, that the network provides are all like vertically integrated with each other, that it's natural for if one wallet uh, does, you know, savers to start, and then it's would, would be kind of natural and common for them to integrate with swaps. And then maybe, you know, lending comes out and they want to offer, you know, Bitcoin loans to their users. And just it's already vertically integrated with everything else they're already doing. It's, it doesn't seem like it's that much of a extra effort just to support lending, for example. And it just becomes like, you know, these features get pushed out from all the wallets and UIs out there and exchanges out there. It's going to be, I mean, that's going to be super bullish about the project for sure. Yeah, I remember one of you telling a story a week or two ago <clears throat> about talking to one of these major wallets and they wanted savers. And then you were like, oh, well, if you do swaps, that's going to create the yield that pays the savers. So you might want to consider both. And like, yeah, those those two together, how that clicks um, and then the synergy between it, it's like it, I, you're going to see all of them probably be interested on both sides. Like why, why would they not when it's kind of like 
feeding off of each other. So either they're like feeding one side and then they're not taking the benefit for their users on the other side or they're just, or, or vice versa, right? So pretty cool. Yeah, so same thing for order books too. Like they'll, they look at access to order books as well once that is finished and shipped, you know, all these features, like, honestly, that's the funny thing about this is like all these features we're talking about, the AMM design, the savers, the lending, synthetics, uh, order books, like all these things are in their own right, like huge advancements in the space, like really revolutionary concepts that are, that provide something that nobody else has ever done before. And, and nobody else is even positioned to do it the way that, the way that we can. And so like, just to see each one of these features come out and just, you know, push the envelope even further than we already did before. It's just, it's a, uh, it's inspiring for sure. I think the last thing on the on the trust wallet points here is ju just how aligned everybody is, especially just on, on the like BSC front. Like ba basically, uh, like everyone's just so adaptable that basically as soon as like trust wallet is, is shipped, uh, people are like, all right, well may maybe we need everyone like everyone's like pivots on one foot at the same exact time, uh, saying like, oh yeah, now is probably the time to start adding BSC and start capturing some some TVL and volume on, on that side. Because now we have this huge new user base, basically, of people who would be swapping. So it, 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 that was just one other point I wanted to call out, just like how aligned and like, like no no one said anything, but everyone just all of a sudden agreed for, for BSC just because it's the most obvious thing to do. And I think everyone sees that and uh, just, just, just knows that that is the right way to go. So there's like instant alignment, even though it was not like, uh, you know, previously the, like the number one priority. So yeah, that I was remember, just cool to see from this end. I remember we were on like a call, like right, right when Trust Wallet like actually launched. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. We're watching the swaps come through. And I remember there was just like a moment where we all like, cause we've been, we've just been in integrations mode and we've also been in like kind of like hardening mode. And we're just like, okay, we, you know, after AVAX, you know, we're gonna take a few months, get these integrations landing. And then we were just like on a call and it was, you know, live and we we're just like, oh my God. And then we all just like, and there's like one moment where we're like, oh yeah, we, we probably should add BSC now. <laughs> we should probably shift back into new chain mode because we had, we just have this built-in stream already. And it was just like a kind of like a one second shift. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's, let's do it. It's also one of the few chains that's already in their, uh, their browser extension. So maybe that's something. Yeah, it would be huge to get into that browser extension as well. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if you guys know or anything, but I, I'd be really excited to see if they kind of get like chain parity with the with the mobile app onto the extension, because then that's like a serious multi-chain browser extension wallet, and that'll be that'll be huge. I mean, it's already like so snappy and quick and nice to use. So personally, it would make it a lot more useful if it had you know Bitcoin, Rune. All that yeah yeah and it would be you know kind of a no-brainer for them as well um so i think i think we'll see it we'll keep pushing i mean and I, I would love to see them integrate savers as well um but you know this is very early on in our you know partnership with trust wallet and i think it's going to continue to develop and only only get better um so we'll keep pushing down these things have we uh shared out the uh dashboard for the trust wallet stuff I don't know if we've kind of put it out publicly. I mean, it is a public flip side dashboard that people can kind of track. Um, yeah. Orswap made it. I don't know what they feel about making it super public. I'm going to leave it to them to share it far and wide if they want to. But I mean, anyone could probably find it if they search through flip side. Yeah. I mean, it is a public website in a sense. Yeah. 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 So um, I'll, I'll just ping Mogarki and see if he minds. Sharing yeah. That. Well, I mean, from the from the dashboard, just to, to go over a little bit, little bit of the numbers, I think it's okay to do so. Um, we've seen almost 400 swaps so far on Trust Wallet, and we've seen about $215,000 in trade volume. We're seeing a little over like $60,000 a day so far, which is kind of funny because um, people have to download the new version of, of Trust Wallet. So it's like, I think it'll take probably a, a, like a month um a full month to get the full kind of swing of trust wallet into the in, into the 14 fold 
Um, so we, we probably won't even see this number fully be what it's going to be until you know a month from now. But like already, we're seeing really good trade volume happening through Trust Wallet. Yeah, and looking at the daily volume and swaps, it they're already increasing every single day. So like that's a trend that's just going to continue. Um, right. And especially when they release iOS, that's going to effectively double, if not more. I think they might have more users on iOS than Android. Um, so yeah, this is just the beginning. I mean, I, I'm so excited to see them like cranking through like 2,000 swaps a day and just have the network just be like humming along and man, that's gonna be great. Yeah, hopefully we get some, some more content and co-marketing going as, as well because I mean, right now I have to imagine it's just that you open the Trust Wallet app and yesterday there was not a swap button and now there is a swap button. <laughs> and it's just some, some users happen to notice that and happen to need to do a swap. But, but once there's kind of like that push of awareness and, and people realize that that's just an integral part of using Trust Wallet, then, then yeah. that's going to be exponential as well. Well, I think there was already a swap button because you can swap through like... Yeah, there was. Uh, there was, so that, but, but, but not on every asset. Like, so if you, uh, if you clicked on like, if you clicked on ETH or something, it'd be a swap button, but then you click on BTC and there'd just be no swap button. So now just yeah. people, yeah, uh, it's just yeah. Sudden, suddenly it, it, it appeared without much, um, you know, uh, education around it. So, so once there's that, yeah. Yeah. I think Cal can speak more to what they plan on doing, but I've heard they're going to maybe even do like a push notification thing. I don't know, Cal. If you yeah, can yeah. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. I totally forgot to, to mention that. So yeah, they, they, there's some stuff planned. We're gonna do. So we were planning a spaces with them. I think we're gonna do it in early 2023 instead. Like, there's really no reason to to burn all of our uh, our like marketing powder basically uh, in like the first week of this integration, being it's not even shipped out to iOS users. So like, I think the best way to do this is kind of just space it out a, a little bit more and like slow burn this a little bit. So we're gonna we're gonna do some Twitter spaces in probably the new year, I, I think. Uh, we're gonna coordinate some stuff with them. Uh, you know, we sent out a bunch of a PR earlier this week. I'm sure people saw, you know, news articles, block works, uh, stuff like that about the, the Trust Wallet integration. Obviously they, they, they tweeted about it already, CZ tweeted about it already. And uh, further than that, they, yeah, they should be like they did announcements on their uh, announcement channel, which is like their discourse forum, um, their Telegram. I didn't actually check their Telegram, so I didn't see if they, they pushed that or not. But they, they should also be doing some kind of push notification slash banner. Uh, like, I'm not sure the, the timing on all these things, but, um, you know, they, they have their own uh, marketing stuff that, that they're doing. And we're, we're definitely working with them to, you know, do as much as we can. Also, like, if there's anything with like Binance Academy or uh you know any of the other educational things uh you know we're definitely gonna collaborate with them on that so like we're, we're definitely in, in touch with their their like marketing uh staff and we're we're working with them uh you know it, it, it's just a matter of like this isn't like a like a hey like a like a time sensitive thing like this is a a slow burn or like a ramp up not like a uh a drop off you, you know uh what, what i'm saying so it'll it'll take a while to get the yeah. to get the volume in there and like the education for the users but uh we're, we're definitely gonna get there so just look yeah. out for that over yeah, the next couple months and we'll do some spaces in, in 2023 we'll, we'll schedule it with everybody once we get some better visibility there absolutely there's no rush and you know we just you know get get ios landed and then we'll be in a prime position to really kick, kick this volume off so uh, i love it i'm so so excited yeah, and especially if they start integrating more features for Thorchain, then it's then you know that's just more continuation upon it. So like you know this is just like again this is like the very 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 start of the you know Thorchain slash trust or just like the the, the like the Thorchain BD plan in, in general, right? All, all these aren't like drop offs; they're they're ramps up and you know very very long ramps up. But you know we'll get to where we need to be eventually. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, not the final form. I mean, only only three chains uh, so far, even so. Who knows? Yeah, this is definitely not the final form. This is like, <laughs> this is like phase one. <laughs> I, I I think we're, we're not super saying it. All right, any uh, I think that's it on on trust. Well, unless there's like people have questions about trust.
But um, maybe we should talk a little bit about impermanent loss protection. I think now is probably the the time to start to get into that and the the new ADR about uh, deprecating impermanent loss protection. So yeah. yeah, let's let's go into that a little bit. Uh, yeah, Chad, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so let's give a little history first, so you will have the context. Um, so impermanent loss protection was was uh, initiated back in the single cha single chain uh, chaos net uh, days, um, and the purpose of that was to we kind of read what what um, they were doing over at um, uh, what's the name of that other uh, dex uh, Bancor. And we, read the, we read about their implementation and it sounded pretty good from our perspective, with, although we had a few changes. Um, and we looked at the actual analysis of like, you know, if somebody is an LP for 100 days, like what um, what is the actual uh, IL that they experience after 100 days? And we found it to be like very, very small, generally speaking. But obviously it happens, but like it's not actually, it's not as big as you might think. And so we wanted to to, to add ILP as a, um, to a, to remove any kind of like hesitations that people might have to add capital into the pools because they're worried about IL and this kind of things. And so we want to be unique in that way and offer that protection. And it's worked very well. Like I think all in all, we've, I think we've um, spent like maybe 3 million or three and a half million room uh, in payouts to ILP in total since the last two years or so, which is, you know, a very small percentage of the, of the reserve and of the pools. Um, but now that we have a new uh, way of providing liquidity to the pool that is not um, exposed to IL, the need for ILP is kind of changed, right? Because now you can just be a saver and not be exposed to two different assets and not have IL. And therefore, you know, if you're if you're a lower risk person, you don't want to deal with IL and this kind of thing, then be a saver. If you want to have a higher risk, higher reward system, uh, then be a dual side LP and get a higher yield, right? With the with the IL risks. And so I think the intention is to 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 drop ILP uh, while grandfathering in um, people who are current LPs. So if you already if you entered the LP, uh, an LP position at the time when LP, ILP existed, then you you still have it. And then once this thing is turned off, any new people that come in, or if you add more capital to a position that you already have, that would also trigger you to not have ILP for those for that case. Is that is that a good synopsis, or does anybody want to add anything to it? Yeah, well, with the specific change, uh, like it, if this ADR is implemented, then ILP, the, the, like, there's going to be a cutoff block, basically, of this is the last block you can enter the, the pools and have full and permanent loss protection. And then after that block, uh, if you if you enter a new symmetric LP position, like a, like a regular LP on, on ThorChain, then you wouldn't receive any impermanent loss protection. But if you entered before that, that, that one particular block, which would be about one month after this, this vote would pass. So like, there's plenty of time for this. And this is, that's why this whole discussion is uh, like, will be happening. I don't think it's even really started yet. Um, but people would get a month to enter in with the current impermanent loss protection. And then after that, uh, New new LPs wouldn't get the impermanent loss protection, but if you entered before, you would still be grandfathered in for the old uh, impermanent loss protection. So, uh, sorry, I saw Pluto jumped up, so I'm sure you can speak more on it. No, you guys are good. That, I don't have anything to add right now. That's that's Sweet. a good that's a good synopsis. Yeah, and, and then, the other thing that which is pointed out in the ADR is just that uh, the basically the entire IL. Um, liability is completely gone at about six dollar rune, and obviously that that decreases as more fees get added to the current LP position. So, like this, this is a um, th th there is a cap on like what the liability I is here. So, and and that, that's going down over time. So, like the, the the purpose of this is basically to make some kind of cutoff date, so that way there, the liability isn't increasing, and then just slowly that decreases over time and just gets uh gets phased out completely eventually as the IL completely disappears. Yeah, I mean that's it in a nutshell. Um some people in the community have been wanting to get rid of ILP for for a long time. They just want to get rid of that kind of that liability in a sense. Um for me, I didn't mind it so much. I don't just didn't think to be that much of a threat or that much of a problem personally. But um and this kind of new direction that we're heading as a as a protocol, in some sense of 
um, heading towards savers and heading towards away from LPs, uh, dual side LPs as like the standard way of providing liquidity, we kind of have to rethink about how we structure some things. And so uh, I think LP has plays less of a role or less of an importance moving forward into the uh, product's future. So maybe one thing we should talk about is um, diffs and LPs, because I don't think we've, we talk, we haven't talked about that for like a long time. So maybe there's people who don't like understand the, uh, the, the, the correlation between the, the current dual sided LPs and synths and, and how that relates to, to Sabres, because they're, they're all kind of interconnected here. And uh, synths play a huge role on the yield of the traditional LPs who are also affected by this impermanent loss protection. So like, let's go into a little bit about the relationship there. Yeah. Basically um, the liability of synths. Yeah. Yeah. So like you can think about this way, that if the uh, people provide capital into the pool and then they get, you know, a claim on, you know, one Bitcoin or a, a, a purchasing power, basically. And so if after they enter the pool, if the room price underperforms the asset, meaning the, the synth purchasing power becomes more, more powerful in a sense or purchases more, more, um, more value. Then that has that has to come from somewhere, and LPs are basically the person that comes from. If Rune overperforms the the asset, then the synth holder needs less value, and therefore that value goes to the LPs, right? In some sense, and so there's a kind of an exposure that LPs have, dual LPs have, to the Rune asset, right? And the, where they're kind of a little more sensitive to the price movements of Rune, right? It's kind of almost, almost like being leveraged in a sense, right? And how much that leverage is, is relative to how much synth utilization there is in the pool at any given moment. If it's like one or 2% synth utilization, then the leverage is basically near zero and it has almost no mathematical effect, right? Uh, if it's at 99%, then on the opposite side of the spectrum, then obviously it's a huge le leverage exposure. And if Rune's performance it does well against asset, you make a lot of fucking money. And if it's the reverse direction, then you lose a lot of money, right? So it it's kind of has a relationship there. Um, with ILP though, ILP kind of played the backstop to it. So even though LPs are kind of on the hook in some sense to the synthetics, the reserve is on the hook to the, to the LPs, right? So even if you get a lot, you experience a lot of losses as an LP from synthetic, you know, assets becoming more valuable than, than the rune asset, the impermanent loss protection becomes kind of like the backstop in a sense to those, to those people. So in the end, it's not even really the LPs themselves who are backing the synths, although they are in a sense. It's actually the reserve that it, it, it provides value to, to support it as well, right? Uh, and so removing ILP uh, from the network means that that LPs don't have that backstop anymore, right? From the, from the reserve anymore, right? Instead, they get a different kind of backstop. And that different kind of backstop uh, is done is the, what we call the POL which accomplishes the same goal in, in, in many respects. So the POL, um, when LPs are losing value, the POL starts to add value back. And it's almost like the POL is like becoming like a bodyguard or like a shield to the LPs. Like it's taking on the, the brunt force of these things. And so it maintains, it protects the LPs in some sense or, or form. Uh, so ILP might be coming disabled, but replacing that with POL kind of, in some sense, replaces ILP. Yeah, I think you explained it really well. Um, I actually don't think it's going to be overly controversial. I, that's just my take. But I think when you first kind of hear ILP is going away, you might be like, ah, oh, like, you know, I really love that feature and it really helped me out. But I think when you understand the whole picture and why and how it, it's, it's liability on the reserve and, you know, that just leads to the that just brings rune into circulation when it's actually being paid out um yeah i think i think people will i think you explained it well and people will understand so yeah pol is a much more elegant solution than just saying that there's insurance for lps so i'm very much looking forward to seeing pol roll out eventually at, like as the synth caps get um get increased and pol comes into play i i the the one thing i just wanted to highlight though um from what what Chad was saying was just the concept of like, you know basically since drawing down um, regular L LP positions because that's like probably the most important.
thing to understand as as an LP. Uh, since since our uh, since value comes from LP units from from the pools, uh, if the value of LP units decrease because rune decreases more than than the asset, so that so more uh, more units need to be basically attributed to the synth holders. That's what takes away from the value of the LPs. So, uh, like th that's that's the number one thing to know as a LP. On Thorchain, if, if you're a if you're a symmetric LP, uh, it's very important to understand like the, the synths relationship with with LPs because um, especially as the uh, synthetic liability is is changing now, it's been it's been static for for a long time, like six six months now, and now that it's increasing, that 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 changes the amount of liability that there can be on, on those pools and um, it increases the amplitude of those uh, of, of those movements right so i just want to point that out yeah i have a i have a community question that's come up a lot uh maybe for chad or, or or pluto but um could you address the concern of you know does this does this make lps no longer first class citizens and and what is a rune holder to do like if they're not at the level of, of running a, a node and lping is kind of now more reserved for uh, for POL and 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 savers depths and synth depth, then you know where does like the average rune holder kind of lie as far as adding adding value to the protocol? Um, so <clears throat> there is a mentality that some people have, and I'm I'm starting to come around this mentality myself. That um, if this network is comprised of basically just the pol and savers and they're more or less i mean anybody who uh, being a dual site lp is still available and anybody who wants to do it they can it's not like that features is going to be like turned off or anything like this but but um if they work predominantly is just pol and savers then it becomes a much more simple design and a much more elegant design it becomes uh, we remove a lot of the complexities of, of being an amm from people's mindsets and we just provide the the value of yield for people without the complexities of like IL and all these kind of things. And then the, then the question becomes like, well, can the network operate safely or scale safely with that mentality? And I think it's actually like uh, the answer, at least the answer for me is absolutely yes, is because uh, the reserve has always been the backstop to the, to the LPs and to the pools. And it's just, now it's just doing it in a more direct way rather than an indirect way of like giving money to LPs. It's just kind of giving money to the pool itself, right? It's a much more effective or efficient way of doing it in some sense. Um, but to answer your question about like what are, what are rune holders to do? Um, I mean, that, that, that's a good question. You can still be a dual-sided dual LP if you want to. I think um, I would probably do it personally just because I, I'm a believer in rune and I think it'll perform very well through the next you know two years and so it'll, it'll the yield that an lp would make in that scenario would be very high just because imagine if it was like 80 percent cents for example right the 80 percent of the the income of the pool um 50 sorry 50 percent of that 80 percent is not going to them it's going to the lps and the lps only have you know 20 percent of the pool including the pol and, and you and so the yield uh, for uh, a dual set LP will be, you know, kind of crazy high, right? Um, of course, it's, it comes with risks, which you should be aware of and take that into account. But but the but me being a person who, who's a believer in Rune and, and thinks it's going to perform well, I would probably consider LPing personally. And and that scenario, even though there's a lot of risk to it, the the upside is pretty large right and maybe i'm okay i wouldn't put my entire room position in that to be honest but like maybe small some smaller position or something like this um oh, yeah, for other questions yeah question. if, you're, if you're if you're long rune why would you do lp you would just end up with less rune if, if the price of rune goes up not necessarily it, it depends right so um if if rune's price goes nowhere right and bitcoin's price goes down then being a dual set LP, you would make a lot more money than if you had just held the room, right? right, right. But, be, but because you're taking a leveraged position on Rune this scenario and a highly leveraged position on Rune, like, you know, if you would held all the tokens, 
yourself, you would you would be um, you would have effectively like instead of having five hundred rune press, uh, um, exposure, you'd have a thousand because you're just holding yourself, just buying it like you were holding. So you'd have that much much exposure. But having half of it and be a Bitcoin, half of it be a rune with a highly rune leverage position, maybe it's like it's like it's basically like having fifteen hundred rune or two thousand rune or some quantity. I don't know. I'm just making up numbers off the top of my head here. So it, it it depends on the amount of leverage and the amount of price change that happens in a sense. Yeah, the the way I see it is like I used this analogy before, but like dual LPs will essentially almost become like algorithmic traders. I mean, I think I think we're we're going to see the most usage of dual LPs from from bots and from from highly sophisticated players who are essentially attempting to smooth out the demand for um, for savings. So when there's high demand for savings, POL only will still drip in capital at a at a steady rate. And so dual LPs may come in to essentially uh, arbitrage the demand on the savings side of things. Um, and essentially, I, I don't think that many people are going to use dual LPs for like long term, um, like long term, just like park your investments. It, it should not be used for that. It should it should be essentially used to uh, take advantage or essentially like a, it's, it's, it's basically like taking a, um, a, like a, like a three X leverage position on wherever, wh whatever way you think the market is going to move. Um, and I think that it'll be, it'll be mainly people like settling intraday, like they might enter a dual sided LP and then exit within like, you know, an hour or something, if they start seeing, um, you know, a market move. So what, what I really liken it to is like, uh, um, uh, man generation at like the top of the um of like a power grid right where you have you essentially have like your renewables and you have you know your 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 uh, nuclear and your forms of energy that are like either sustainable or cheap to operate um and then you have like um you have types of energy that are a lot more expensive to operate but um you can sell them for a lot more because uh you know it's easy to bring them online quicker so you can you can you know use them to like smooth out peak demand, um, and that's where like we see that's where I kind of liken like du like dual side LP is almost to like like to like a coal power plant right it's it's a it, it's not for everyone um, and it's it, you know it's dirty in the sense that like there's a lot of risk um, going into it but you have an opportunity to make a lot of money with it if you know what you're doing if you don't know what you're doing just stick to the basics just be a be a saver and you know, so I think where I think that leaves the question and like, and, you know, to Chad, uh, Chad T's question about what are you to do if you're a room um, holder and you just want to like, you know, basically contribute to the network somehow. I think a, a couple of ideas have been floated before we talk about the, um, the on the security side. Um, Chad, I know you uh, had some ideas about whether people could participate in the protocol reserve or in protocol liquidity itself. What, and I, I, I seem to recall you said that that design might not work. So what would what would prevent me from like, you know, uh, depositing to the protocol reserve so that I have a stake in the protocol and liquidity? Why wouldn't that Why wouldn't that design work as a way to do like single sided staking for room? Um, so that 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 you is possible. You could do that uh, the, from a technical perspective. There's not much reason why you couldn't accomplish that task. The question is, um, how does it provide value to the network, right? Because if you're providing rune to the reserve to be used for the POL, the amount of rune that the POL needs to deploy in any given pool is de is determined, right? It's determinate. And it doesn't really matter if you provide a rune or you didn't provide rune, the amount of rune in the network for, for, from the POL's like, position is the same, right? So you providing rune to the POL to to you know, provide capital for it to, for it to deploy doesn't actually change the amount of room that's being deployed into the pools, right? So you're not actually contributing to the depth of the network, depth of the pools. And so, and so it becomes less valuable from the network perspective of what it's trying to accomplish. But then you have the question of like, well, do people put provide rune to different pools so they can pick which of the POLs of which chains or which which asset they, they want to provide rune to, or are they just going to apply the rune to all the different things and they get price exposure to all the different assets, right? Or do you do it kind of similar to savers and say, 
it's a rune on rune in thing, in which case there's like now a synthetic rune in some sense, interspering synthetic rune in a sense. And then that actually would probably increase risk on the protocol rather than decrease it. You know, and the question is, is it worth that additional risk that the protocol had to take on to, to accomplish that task? Um, to me, it just feels like, I know people like the idea of, hey, I buy a token and then I stake that token or I do something with it and then I, I get more yield from it. And the problem with that mentality is that you cannot generate yield from within yourself, right? It's like, it's like you cannot pick yourself up by your own belt. It's, it doesn't make any sense, right? The only way you can generate like actual yield is by providing a service that somebody else is willing to pay for and then pay fees to do so, right? Like when somebody provides staking into Atom, for example, and they put up their Atom tokens and they stake it into some validator, you are not providing a service or something valuable that anybody else gives two shits about, right? Nobody cares whether or not Chad Thoreau stakes his Atom tokens into a validator set or not. You're not providing value. You're not providing service. You're not doing anything worthwhile. In which case, what that means, because nobody's providing uh, a service that somebody else is willing to pay for, well, then how does it, how does it generate yield? Well, it steals money from everybody else. You're, you're, re you're basically reallocating, like in a very socialistic mentality, you're re reallocating value from up from one atom holder and you're giving it to another atom holder for whatever reasons or purpose. And you're basically just like cannibalizing your own community, which is just structurally, I don't personally agree with that mentality at all, right? And so in order for people to provide rune and get a yield in that rune, they have to do something that is valuable to the network that the network is willing to pay you for, right? Being a- and I, also think, I also think they have to take risk too. You know what I mean? Like there is no free lunch. You, you, if, you're, if you're doing anything with capital, it means you have to take a risk on it, right? You right. have to be willing to say like, I'm making an investment. It's possible that I get this payout, but it's also possible that I don't. Right. And this idea that like crypto is just like an endless wellspring of money, of free money that people can, you know, and I'm speaking directly to staking, this concept of staking. I mean, I also hate it. And I think you're completely right. Like you're not providing any value by staking. So I, I, I've really appreciated that ThorChain has resisted the urge to implement some kind of, you know, uh, just like staking vault mechanism um, for Rune. I, I, I think that it's it's completely um, backwards to the goal we're trying to accomplish here, which is to get Rune deployed into the system in a way that helps the protocol. Right, right. I mean, I, I'll always stay open to the idea of finding a way to use Rune to, to generate a yield, but uh, the ways that I've thought about it thus far are just not you know so what about what about if there what about if there's like a like a, a a protocol reserve like front front loader front load pool right where like instead of uh dripping um like basically if that pool is empty then it uses the protocol reserve for pol but if there's anything in that um in that um in that vault or whatever then it uses that before it uses the protocol reserve so people can basically say i want to stake my room to go to the front of the queue to get my protocol owned liquidity um, my, my, my rune added to the POL, to the protocol on liquidity. And then essentially that is taking a share in the overall PL of, of POL. Yeah, you can do that. But then the question becomes, like, why would the POL give space to like, to Pluto to provide room when it can just do it itself with its own capital and make its own reward? Right. Well, like because a, that, I mean, I, I think the idea is at some point, Right. You're going to, you, we're going to deploy 30, 50, you know, $70 million, so 70 million rune of 160 or maybe even 80, maybe even half the protocol reserve. I don't know. Maybe didn't, who, didn't you guys float something as high as like a hundred million for protocol or for POL? Um, okay. So no, sorry. There, like, we, we were saying like 80 million in bond. If we, were, if we were thinking about like, what, are the, what, what is the, what is the ideal, um, you know, equilibrium of the system? I saw yeah. someone floated some numbers. Yeah, so that's becomes that comes down to the idea of the synth caps, right? So the higher we place the synth caps, let's say we put them at like, you know, 80%, let's just say. And that means we need, so that means for every like dollar that goes into to savers, we need to deploy 25 cents from the, the, the POL, right? And so we don't need 100 million. We actually can become more capital efficient. We need, we need you know, 20 million. 
right? Instead of a hundred million from the re from the actual reserve, right? And it goes even I just higher. Wanna, I, just, I just wanna point out for anyone in the audience, what, what you're suggesting, 85% synth cap is crazy. That is that is fractional reserve banking. That that is saying there is not, not fractional money. reserve banking. Come on, man. It's it's, it's literally it's, the opposite. Of, it's like you're it's, literally the opposite of fractional reserve banking. No, it, yeah, it's saying it's saying that the amount of debt that we have is not backed by one to one by the by any real assets. It's saying that for for every twenty synthetic Bitcoin there in the pool, there's only like fifteen or twelve no, no. real Bitcoin. It's the opposite. It's not the pool that's backing the, the synth at that point. It's the reserve. That's I'm, the reserve. The, the actual it's, L1 assets. That means there's no longer 20 Bitcoin for at 50 at 50 percent, right? At 50 percent synth cap, there's there could be 20 Bitcoin in the pool, and there could be 20 Bitcoin worth of uh, worth of synthetic Bitcoin. And if all the people that went to go redeem their synth um, did so then the pool would essentially not have any more L1 Bitcoin. What you're saying is that if you want to raise the synth cap to 85%, okay, I'm talking about L1, right? Not, not Rune, not, I'm saying that the L, amount of L1 asset that is backing the synth is less than the amount of outstanding synth. And that is just crazy to me. That is, okay. So let me understand, I, let me explain some things to you. I think, I think you might be missing here, right? All this, all this synthetic asset does is it, per, it makes it basically a promise that it's worth the same as like a one synthetic Bitcoin is worth one real Bitcoin in purchasing power, right? It doesn't really matter if that is that, that purchasing power is coming from an actual physical Bitcoin, right? Or, Bitcoin's not physical, but you know what I mean by that. Uh, or if it's coming from Rune or it's coming from Reserve or whatever, it doesn't actually matter. The question is whether or not, can I redeem my synthetic Bitcoin for one actual real Bitcoin, right? And we're not doing any kind of fractional thing where it's just like, oh, we have a thousand synthetic Bitcoins, but you know, we only have purchasing power of 10 Bitcoins. And so now we're doing this fractional reserve thing that you're referring to. That's never the case. It's never fractional reserve. It's always much more collateral or much more purchasing power than the value of the synthetics by a good margin, by orders of magnitude, in fact. So where it's not, does that come? It, comes, it comes from the pool and it comes from the, from the reserve. Because reserve, in fact, is the POL. So if you get to some crazy situation where the synthetic value is going up for some reason, right, and the room value is more or less staying the same, for example, and we've now gotten to a place where um, synthetic value is greater than the value of the pool, all that just means is the POL just deploys more room until it gets to the point where that's no longer the case. Like, like, like the actual pool, like the amount of room in the actual, uh, in the POL, like deployed into the into the actual pool, doesn't really matter all that much. It's what's actually what's backing it is not just the, like what it's deployed, but what it has to, to, to deploy as well. Do you well, know what, what I mean happens, by that? What happens when you reach the max amount of network deposit for the for POL? Do you, do you look at the issue of, of being like essentially um, underwater on those synths and you say, okay, well, all we need to do is just raise that. We need to keep raising this. We need to keep, you know, um, essentially dripping more rune into the pool. Then you just right. end up like Luna Foundation where you're just, selling you're just selling your token to be able to what? acquire bitcoin to backstop yeah, yeah you're just trying to cut you're trying to you're trying to fill a hole you're you're, you're selling your token to uh, buy an asset to fill a hole okay let me let me explain that max pol thing we're talking about the only reason why that exists is just to slow roll the release of the pol itself but at the some long... point you run out of you run out of dry powder right at some point you just you run out of the ability to do that it's not infinite Right. It's not infinite, but neither are the pools, right? If, if we didn't have the hard caps on the pools and people could deploy, you know, $500 billion of, of Bitcoin into savers, then I'd totally be on your page. I'd be like, oh, well, now we're in real trouble, right? But there are caps on these things, right? The value of the rune in the reserve far outweighs the value of the, of the, uh, the assets in the pool and the synthetic assets and all those things far away and it's and it, it mathematically pretty much ensures that i mean technically it's possible in some extreme scenario where like rune's price goes down like 30x or something crazy like this but like generally there are hard caps on these things to to ensure that this not doesn't go into some wavy you know fractional reserve thing that you're freaking talking about it's it has orders of magnitude i think it's like five or six x more available to it right
Not to mention the reserves of actually making money uh, probably as part of this because it's owning 20% of the pool with a high leverage position. So it's just going to make a massive quantity of money just part of the process. But like, so I don't really consider that to be like, at least in my view, people are welcome to disagree with me on this, but to be unnecessarily a, a large problem. Does that make sense to you or no? Yeah, I just, you know, okay. All right, we can, we can move on. Um, Let's talk about on the let's talk about on the security side. Like it, I, I we recently floated the idea of increasing the number of bond providers for a node and then allowing anonymous anonymous node uh, node providers essentially, so that like someone could bond into a node where they may not even necessarily like know that person. Um, that was floated as like a potential way to you know allow people to fake rune quote unquote you know just if they don't have the minimum amount to run a node themselves. Um, what did you think about that? I, I think there was some, some split opinion on that one. I mean, I personally dislike it. We've always had the stance that allowing anonymous people to provide capital to anonymous people to secure the network is, you know, to me, that's not secure. What, I about, what, about, what about if the node operators are like semi-docs, you know, like what if, what if they're so quote unquote trusted entities within the nine realms ecosystem? What if, Warsaw is running one. What if Nine Realms is running run? What if yeah, but XD why would we want to, one? Why would we want to lean in the direction of of trusted? Like why are we why are we going to introduce the idea of trust into the network all of a sudden? Because I think I think what's going to happen is that like people don't need our permission to do this today, right? Like like we can't prevent someone from spinning up like Thor Swap from, for example, spinning up a DAO and saying, "Hey guys, we're just going to accept." rune deposits and then we're going to put it into node for you guys and we're going to pay you out so like it's like a kind of like a black market thing right eric so if we try to ban it from happening people are just going to go underground with it which that is a more trusted relationship than if you can do it at the protocol level where it's like non-custodial and people can just deposit into it right so i'm just kind of trying to think ahead like if the demand if if, if we see bond apys go up to like 200 percent, somebody somewhere is going to be like well fuck i'm going to leverage my reputation in this community i have two hundred thousand twitter followers i'm just going to run a fucking node and accept you know room deposits from people and do it anyway so like I, I don't see how we can prevent that from happening once it becomes that lucrative right but we can't prevent people from doing that and we can't prevent people from doxing themselves as, as nodes all we can do is, is establish culture like i don't i wouldn't publicly tell people like do not give your room to some random person who says they're gonna you know build a node with it no, nope. people are going to do it anyway. <laughs> I mean, if they if yeah. you want if you want to do it, you can, and you you know you you might lose all your fucking rune. It's I might I can't stop people from you know taking um, risky actions, but to sponsor that from the protocols perspective is even is I don't know it's even worse yeah. from my perspective. I think there's a steel man case to be made for increasing the increasing the amount of bond providers to 100 or so and uh, like I, I think the reason for that is um you know people th this is just like the, the argument you know for increasing the amount of bond providers uh obviously like people want to know that the door chain network is decentralized and i think anyone that's been here long enough knows that it is like it is pretty decentralized and there's a lot of different uh, node, node operators who have a lot of different interests and who all you know work together to make this network work but um i think like from an outside perspective of especially like if people who are not currently in the network saying like oh you, you could start a start a thor node and obviously this is this is a this is a trusted relationship thing where you need to know the identity of the of the people who are running the node or have some kind of recourse where if they did somehow you know do something to you or steal from you, you at least know who they are or have some kind of way to take action uh, against them, or at least, you know, have not, not just be like, damn, they just stole all my money. I have no idea who they are or anything about them. Right. But it, it, it does create uh, obviously a lot more trust for the validators, but at the same time, it, it gives the opportunity for new validators to come up where they, they wouldn't in the first place where there, there isn't that like initial capital to start the validator. So instead you can get these community pool validators where they might not have the same trust assumptions as like a completely anon validator set, but you would get that, uh, 
you you would you would know that there's these groups of people that are that are running these validators that are obviously like separate from any other groups in the network. It just increases the uh, perception of decentralization in the network. Just there being more node operators from from different entities. Like it, I think that the Thor swap example is is perfect. If they started running nodes as as a DAO, um, you know, had some kind of it's some, some kind of way to, to minimize trust there obviously that 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 is like the crux of of the issue i i think um just the amount of trust that you need to give to them with, with your with your rune but you know there's plenty of businesses that exist like that uh that, that like, like today already so um just not in, not in Thorchain yet so i i think that's a a valid argument for wanting to increase to say like a hundred or, or something. I, I think once you get into the, the realm of like, you know, thousands and, and Adam, uh, like, like, you know, cosmos style, then it becomes kind of, kind of different. But, um, I think that there's a valid argument to be made for, uh, you know, the side of being able to spin up more bond providers. What do you guys think? I mean, I, I would vote against it personally. Um, if I was a voter, um, but also also because in part because the mechanism we we are planned to scale the bond is not by allowing random people to to bond with random people, which creates security risks and issues. Instead, it's, it's the lending design to create a, a large quantity of <clears throat> buy and burn pressure on the rune asset to scale the rune price that scales the bond, which scales the security. Like that's the way to do it. Not so much to like, let's just like reduce the security of the network and just, just because we're, we're greedy to get a, a deeper bond. Do you think it actually reduces the security of the network? Wouldn't it just be the security of those individual people who are bonding to it? Because I, I think adding just new nodes to the network, even if, you know, they're uh, doxed, does that actually decrease the security of the network itself? Well, the problem is that like, how many of these nodes you're talking about are run by one person versus different people who are or are not colluding with each other? So they like, but can't like can't people be given like the sort of latitude to like determine that like right like it's like okay nine realms run we say we're running one Thor swap is running one like now we've essentially opened up one point eight million worth of like staking capacity for the the community like I think that would make a lot of people really happy, right? A lot of Thor Chads would love to participate in that. And like, we know that, you know, Thor Swap and Nine Realms are likely going to, you know, keep their word when it comes to the fact that like, you know how many we're running or whatever. I, I just, I, I, I can, I, I do see your, your point. Like there could be, you know, some cabal of people who are running these, like, you know, they're all colluding together and they all have like all their alts on, you know, crypto, crypto Twitter are each shilling their validators as being like separate, but they're really all like acting together and colluding. But like how many people, how many Thor Chads on stage right now would actually just like, you know, stake to someone who wasn't like a known community figure? Uh, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're, I don't think people are just going to stake to random validators. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the way I see this more as is just being like, oh, Binance is running a, a, a Thor node and wants wants bonders. Obviously, like Binance has enough room to run their own Thor nodes or whatever. But uh, I'm saying like you know, tr Trust Wallet or Edge Wallet, better, like a better example, like a smaller wallet wants to run their own infrastructure, but they don't have the upfront capital to do that. So they could you know source it from so the then, community. And you yeah. right, and like obviously, like there are that, these problems that, that come up with Chad's thing. But I'm just saying that like you know it, it, there there's two ends of it here where I think. You know, there's the negative end and there's the, the positive end of it. Also, but, would it really be hidden if, like, let's say ThorSwap did it and, like, you didn't know how many nodes uh, they were running? Well, if I go to ThorSwap interface and I deposit Rune, like, wouldn't you be able to track, like, oh, that went to this node? I mean, so wouldn't, couldn't we, like, figure out how many a, a doxed uh, operator is, is running? You guys, you guys can, you can send to multiple addresses. Like each person has a different address, which goes to, diff to a different node, and you're operating multiple nodes. Like we've yeah. always said from, from the beginning that we want nodes to be anonymous. We don't want them to be docs. We don't want them publicly talking about who they are, you know, where they run their node, phys geologically speaking. We don't want people to like have that ability because all of a sudden, 
I know, I'm, you know, I'm running a node and I know that Pluto is running a node because he's part of Nine Realms. And I know Chad Throw is running a node because he's part of ThorSwap. I know Familiar Cow is doing it because blah, 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 whatever. And then I start DMing all you people and saying, let's let's cause this whole thing to crash and let's, or, or something like this. It's like some malicious kind like, of action. Why would any of us do that? <laughs> well, none of us We're would all... actually do that, obviously. But I'm just saying that like yeah. part of the protection trust isn't... at that point. Yeah, like I don't want anybody to trust that Pluto is cool. And Pluto won't do something malicious, or me, or Chad Thoreau, or Familiar Cow. Like this whole thing is designed to be trustless from the get-go, and the idea of inserting trust for the first time in the, in the protocol's history is, you know, against everything that it stands for. At least, at least for me, so, that's true. So, so my question is, how is this different than like kind of what's already happening? Because like, are we already there? Already are bond providers, and obviously that's limited to I think five or something like that. But it, it, like it's already very, it, it's just a, a scale up of kind of the, the already what's kind of the business model of of nine realms of you know having bond providers and then running infrastructure for others. Um, so how do you guys think so about that particular thing? Because so it's already kind of happening. That's because in this in that bond provider scenario, you have to be doxed between, or rather, the operator has to be doxed. The the provider doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be, but you have that ability to, to know who you're operating with, and then you have the ability to have, you know, le legal re repercussions on that person if they were to do something against the best interests or sign a contract that says they will not, you know, do X, Y, and Z or or whatever. And you can't do that from, a, from an anonymous perspective, nor can you do it on some sort of large scale with like 100 different providers. You have to find like you and a couple of your friends to get together, run a node together, right? It doesn't really change much in that regard. But allowing anonymous people on the on the open protocol, I think, would be detrimental to its safety. Don't yeah, I kind I mean, I definitely get where you're coming from. Um, let's look at the other side of it. Like, think about if your trust wallet right now, and we told them like, hey, you know, um, Nine Realms could run a node for you, and you can just have all your users stake by just sending a transaction with this memo to you know the the bond module and then they would immediately be earning you know single-sided rune yield through your app you guys could take an affiliate on that or whatever you guys like you know you, you can take a fee through like we, you know, we, we figure that out right and then so now there's there's some agreement between like trust wallet and nine realms like where you know we basically have have Find a contract with them that says like you know we will not rub their users so like there's there's essentially that same legal agreement that you said there but basically on behalf of all the people that they're putting in the front door through um through their app right and so what that then does is that then creates a it brings us closer to entities like trust which i think you know, that's obviously something that we want is that, that more more people in the ecosystem more big players in the ecosystem are like you know it's just it just means like Thorchain and Rune is just gaining notoriety and it's gaining reputation. But then it also, it encourages their users to actually buy Rune, right? They, they're going to want to say, hey, buy Rune and stake it to our node directly from within Trust Wallet, like on the Rune wallet page, right? Like they're just, you can see, you can see like how this just opens up new possibilities for new products or stronger partnerships for more capabilities um, for, you know, just the average Thorchain user. So you know, I, I think I think you know that, right? I think you you get that, and that's just kind of the other side of this, right? But it's just, you know, at some point, right? Like, the, we are we are constrained in how much we can scale this network on on the bond side, and there are only going to be so many people that um you know have the risk tolerance to hold nine hundred thousand you know rune, and and for that really to be a major investment and a major you know thing for them. So, I, I actually I was asked this by the um by a community member. I had a call with a community member the other day and he was saying, you know, like uh, I have, you know, I have clients who um, they don't really like, they don't take a, they don't take a position if it's like less than, you know, 30 mil, 40 million, you know, like big, big family offices wanting to get in, involved in nascent crypto and, you know, our name, or your name come and came across our desk and blah, 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 blah. I don't know how legit that is or not, but you know, he's just basically saying like you know that i'm i've been looking at your guys's um tokenomics and everything and like the big thing i want to know is like how how do you guys scale this from being like to basically being able to have like a billion in tpl 
Um, and so, and so, I mean, like, let's, let's go through those things real quick. And I think there's a number of things that we've talked about on this call, but let's just, let's just go through them all really quickly. So Chad, to your point, like creating buy and burn pressure on the rune and price asset itself via lending increases the price, which increases the value of the already bonded rune. So that's like one way we could scale the network, right? Um, we just talked about like um, increasing, increasing the number of bond providers or, or rather decreasing the uh, barriers to entry to becoming um, a node operator. Um, that's another one that we just talked about. We also talked about um, being able to take a stake in, um, in protocol owned liquidity, like whether that's like, you know, some, uh, I, I personally like the idea of, of being able to like choose which pool you want to add, like you want to add a rune into. Um, so that, so that's, you know, definitely designed to explore. What else, what, what other ways can we, you know, and, and, and it can either be like, like allowing the network to scale or just like allowing more people to participate, whatever that is. Um, can we think of any other ones? So are, are you trying to think about ways we can scale the bond or ways we can scale the, the TVO? Well, I, aren't those two sort of like interconnected? I mean, it, there's a relationship between them. Um, yeah. Scale, but they're but they're it's a very different um, procedure or process to scale one versus the other. A very different mentality. If that makes sense. So, like, I think yeah. at least for me, the solution to scaling the the TVL to me is going to be savers because there's a massive quantity of people who want to earn, you know. ETH on their ETH or BDC on their BDC. Like this is one of the most brilliant things about Thorchain as a project that really don't doesn't get enough attention or, or credit is that every other layer one in crypto is trying to beat every other layer one. Everybody's like being arg argumentative and combative, and it's a, it's a you know it's a um, it's a zero sum game. And like Solana is trying to take out um, Ethereum, and Apex is trying to take out Solana or whatever. Same thing with like like layer twos, Ar Arbitrum, Polygon, these kind of things are just like fighting these battles with each other. But what's so unique and different about Thorchain is that it, it actually doesn't do that. It does the op opposite of that. It's not trying to beat Ethereum or beat Bitcoin or beat anything else out there. It's just trying to contribute significant value to them. And so by pulling on that string as a methodology to scale the pools by having them getting Bitcoin yield in their Bitcoin or ETH yield in their, or their ETH or whatever, or Dash or Doge or whatever it might be, like that can scale this thing so much farther. Like the, the 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 market cap of all those tokens combined to the to the depth of the security of the network is like was it like ten thousand x? Like there's there's I mean that, I think that that's why I feel like we've basically solved the, the the liquidity issue, and that will scale naturally uh, with the network pretty pretty easily. I think this this is my two cents. This scaling the the bond though. Is a very diff different beast. We've talked about scaling the bond on and off since the beginning. Since we heard, since it's we hit it's your favorite, it's, it's your favorite subject, Chad. It it is a, a difficult subject. Like that one, like scaling the volume through integrations is relatively like easy. It's just about selling an obvious and easy like and perfect product for Trust Wallet or whatever. Scaling the the pools became easy once we actually understood the savers concept, right? I mean, we still have the same the same problem: how we scale the bond, and that's a much more difficult and complex way to do so. And despite my best efforts and other people's best interests to figure a more a creative way to allow random people to to bond randomly into the network, I, I, to be honest, I just never found a way to do it in a way that maintained economic security. So that's why we started yeah. to reach out to scale the network, the bond, not in terms of a total of rune deposited to the bond, but scale on the other side of the candle, which is, you know, what can we do that that, that creates buy pressure on the rune asset in significant ways, while also actually providing a really good and valuable service that is actually, you know, people are willing to use and pay money to use rather than just like some Ponzi nomic bullshit, you know, of minting to infinity or, or, you know, promising some ridiculous yield that it doesn't make any sense. And so I think we've done that with the with the learning design. And I think that's the I think we should give that a try and see how it goes before we Yeah. Know, talk. For sure. Yep. Well, cool. um, good good discussion there, I think. All right, whatever. Go ahead. 
Sorry. <laughs> if, if you have more to say on that, you can go. No, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. I was just going to start throwing out crazy ideas, but we can save up for another oh, time. Oh, we're, we're at that point already? Crazy no, ideas. No, no, I love no, crazy no, ideas. No, no, I love no, crazy I, ideas. I like crazy ideas. Uh, it's, it's, it's too close. We're on to Discord. No, you know, it's, it's, it's not Twitter this time. Like, it's just Discord. We're good. <laughs> we're good. Yeah. <laughs> what if we get rid of the bond and we have Trump uh, digital cards be the, yes. the bonding asset instead of room? What do you guys think? Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> I was thinking this morning, what if there was only one rune and it was just fractional rune that was, you, you, just, you just deposit like, you know, no, 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 400,000 tour. <laughs> <laughs> what about this? All right, but actual crazy idea. What, all right, so what if, and so like, I think, okay, imagine, imagine we like hit the security cap because, you know, it's so expensive to provide, um, um, you know, imagine like the collateralization ratio, like is, is, you know, we're kind of just like running, you know, running hot, right? Where we're just like, okay, we've written up a bunch of loans and, you know, we've got a bunch of, you know, that TVL do the savings and we've hit the security cap and we kind of just like run out of, or, or, or potentially maybe what if we even like hit the throughput, right? Like what if we just are processing too many transactions and, and we can't extract any more fees and, um, and, you know, so we're, so we're kind of just like stuck, right? Um, what about, um, have you given any thought to the idea of like sharding ThorChain? So basically like creating, ending up like essentially satellite networks where it's just like, maybe it's just like um, 10 or 12 validators get together and decide to essentially put up all of the um, Bitcoin and Rune needed to just basically run like a, like almost like we were talking about with vault nodes before, but um, it's just like one asset, one pool on its own sort of like side chain. And then it uses IBC to beam native Rune back and forth. And then you can just expand the TVL of like Bitcoin by just using, by essentially like depositing into the, into the, you know, Bitcoin Thor chain, you know, side chain. Is that is that crazy, or, or or would something like that work to basically, if we found that like okay, like ninety eight percent of you know the TVL is Bitcoin, and we just like are we can't we we want to become this you know liquid Bitcoin liquidity black hole, and we want there to be more Bitcoin in in um you know in Thorchain than on all the sexes combined. It is how how do we do that without like without like spinning up new networks that have like different security um essentially just like different security envelopes right like like can you have is that possible are there, are there things that we we should just start doing research on now that we have a solution in place when we when we do hit that we, we actually did talk about this concept uh, a long long time ago i was <clears throat> i actually was living in australia for a little while and in the earliest days of like the architecture design of this network and me and the, kind of like the early people, um, you know, it would sit every day on with a dry erase board and, and draw different ideas and concepts. And we would go to lunch together and just start throwing crazy ideas at each other all the time and trying to think of solutions to problems, which we eventually found. And that's what ThorChain is today in some sense. Um, but the reason why we, we kind of went against the, the notion of like multiple multiple chains or multiple networks that could all kind of cohere into one large one in some sense or form is because... Um, First of all, the technical complexity of that would be significantly higher, right? To be able to, to communicate across multiple chains like that, would, I think, would just make the product even more ambitious, even more complex than it already is uh, at, at the time. So it wasn't something I really wanted to take on in the earliest days. But also, um, it creates like, you know, a little bit of a Frankenstein security model where where the security of the Bitcoin is different than the security of the Doge, than the security of the Litecoin. And then that becomes a difficult thing to reason about of like, what if I provide my, my Litecoin into this network, like what is the security model here and why is it different than every other asset? And that just becomes another layer of complexity that the user has to comprehend, which is just, you know, as complex as a network already is, we didn't want to put even more complexity on top of all that, right? So for me, it's like, it's probably just not worth the extra security um, extra technical complexity to maintain and build that and the bugs and possible exploits and all that kind of stuff. And it just made sense to keep it a more of a uniform uh, structure that would be, that gives everything the same security, the same design, the same, you know, more or less everything. 
Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think I mean I think I think it does open. There are some really novel designs that you could come up with. I mean, when when you guys talked about that back in the day, did IBC exist? No, IBC didn't exist until like a year ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it was talked about. It was like something on on paper, right? Yeah. And it's part of the reason why we built Thor, built Bifrost is because IPC didn't exist, and it, and if it did, wouldn't be able to accomplish the things we needed to accomplish, like integrating with Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example. Um, and yeah. you know, to be honest, I was always very bullish on IBC. It wasn't until I actually started to like really get into the weeds of it and and try to try to implement it on Thorchain that I become more bearish on on its design, just because I was really bullish on it and i think we all were i think you were there too like you and me and gavin yeah, yeah. We, were all, we were all like like let's get ibc integrated we we're all like positive and every time we tried to do so there's some layer of of stupidness that you know would just break everything and we're just like none of this makes sense to us and we just like kept like, hitting our, our heads in against the wall for months trying to figure out a way that to make this thing actually work and still uphold the standards of security that we we had kind of put forth to begin with and it was just it's just too difficult yeah. to be honest I'm, I'm just thinking because like we've been having, um, I don't know if I can say this, but we've been having conversations with like like centralized exchanges who want to start using Thorchain as their asset background, as their asset infrastructure, essentially mm -hmm. to be able to have um, proof of reserves from day one with an integration, right? Just basically being able to outsource this whole problem, this whole headache of, you know, whoa, we have, you know, like, Proof of reserves and all this like auditing and all this. It's like it, it's actually going to be easier in the future for sexes to just wrap um, um, dexes, which I think the Thorchain Twitter account was alluding to this morning at some point. Um, but anyway, like there's 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 interest among um, centralized exchanges to wrap the um, the in, the you know the Thorchain infrastructure, and so I'm just wondering if like. Um, you know, I, I just think that like the, the security is going to be tough if they're like, well, we have, you know, a billion dollars in Bitcoin deposits. Like, how do we how do we transition that over to your system as quickly as possible? Um, is there you know, I'm thinking about like, is there a way to do that that allows them to leverage the technology of Thorchain while not being like a thousand percent within our system yet? So they still kind of like retain control over um you know um like their design but i was i was almost thinking like like they can just run like a private validator set of their own thorchain sidechain and then all they have to do is put up like one to one bitcoin with rune so they buy a bunch of rune and then they basically can use that to extend the existing liquidity pools i don't know i'm just it's just it's crazy but you're talking about like i'm just trying them like expanding like having the public Bitcoin pool, like, but then and they uh, append to it their own private liquidity that only they have access to. Is that what you mean? Uh, something like that. I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's 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 just it's just the idea that like say, floating yeah. around is if, if is there a way to like take a centralized entity who will always be centralized, but allow them to somehow participate in the Thorchain network while essentially contributing to um, the the liquidity, but like so basically like. They could be using Thorchain for all of its like you know transparency benefits, but they would still be like their users would still be transacting with the their Bitcoin pool, but just using um, Thorchain and basically creating some incentive for them to like buy Rune or whatever to use it in their own private network or something. I, I don't know. It's, that sounds stupid. Never mind. I mean, I I just got a uh, a message today from Kyle Samani over at MultiCoin. He was like asking something similar to this question. I'd like. Are there any centralized exchanges that are looking to, you know, be the fiat on ramp, off ramp, but not do any of the actual like crypto trading, and then instead of all of that, just gets like pushed on to Thorchain, right? So they only just carry dollars, and maybe they carry you know Bitcoin, or maybe maybe it's stable, depending on how they want to structure it, and they just and whenever somebody says, "Hey, well, here's some dollars, and I want I want Doge," it takes the dollars and it sells the Bitcoin that it has into Thorchain, and then the Doge gets sent to um, you know, the Doge address, whatever address that might be. And so like, that is an interesting concept, um, but it's not really using its own private liquidity. It's actually just utilizing liquidity that already exists. They don't, even, they don't even necessarily have to have much for liquidity other than just to like, you know, back the value of, the, of their dollars and their Bitcoin or whatever to, to interact. But 
I think that's a fascinating idea, whether or not somebody will actually do it or not. I mean, it definitely won't be Thor chain, but maybe, maybe Thor wallet would do it. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, here's an interesting question from, um, and from the thread. I, I wanted to get to this one. Um, Yangu via basic says, uh, what are we going to do to scale stablecoin TVL further? Stablecoin will not be a part of savers yet. The depth of stable coin pools will affect lending UX. Um, what do we, yeah. So when we get rid of, when we get rid of impermanent loss protection too, there's really no incentive to do LP on stables. So unless you're like already grandfathered into ILP. So what's the, yeah. What do we do about stable coin depth on Thorchain? How do we scale that? Um, I mean, that's been a debate I've, I've had with other people, other devs of like, should we allow uh, savers for, for stables? And I've been personally kind of leaning against it and other people have been leaning for it. And it's, it's kind of a, a debated topic. Um, it's not actually all that important that, uh, that, the, that the stable coins are deep. They don't have to be $100 million deep to, to work and do the, what, they're, what they're designed to do. Um, <clears throat> When you're actually getting out your loan, you're you're getting out. You're probably going to be getting out not, not like a two to one ratio, but like a two hundred percent CR. You're, you're probably something closer to six, probably. I'm guessing. And so, like, if you put in a large quantity of money, you know, swapping your Bitcoin to to wrap asset Bitcoin, and that be the, your collateral. The, you're you're going to take one one eighth of that, or one sixth of that, or some number, whatever the hell it's going to be, uh, to get your to get your stables. In which case, the swap fees matter less because your your debt is a lot less than your collateral. Um, yeah, I, I'm not terribly concerned about it personally, but if it actually does get so shallow that it becomes problematic, then, you know, we can, we can talk about that, but there is a lot of drive for value into the savers already just because arbitrage bots use, um, uh, stables as their kind of like their settlement asset. So there's a lot of trading happening on the stables more so than other, other assets relative to their depths. So it, I don't know. We'll we'll see. We, we can adjust as we need to adjust, but I don't I don't think it's a problem we're going to really going to need to solve personally. Uh, on that, can you remind us just what's what's the main argument against stable savers? Um, the main argument that, that at least that I have is that um, we only have so much security in the network, right? So much room on the bond side to secure this network, and we want our we want our uh, our pools to be deep, the ones that are actually going to be used, right? Because I think we've all kind of like acknowledged at this point that, you know, people aren't going to trade to USDC on ThorChain for the most part because you can just do it on via, you know, tax aggregation and, and probably get a better price, right? Um, and so why are we going to spend the time or the, spend the security, um, you know, the security space, if you want to call it that, on a, to make a pool deep that, you know, really isn't going to be used all that much other than just being more or less a price oracle for uh, the Tor asset, which is for the lending design, right? Uh, I'd rather have the pools, we have, like the primary asset pools, the gas asset pools to be as deep as possible, personally, rather than getting UCC to be, you know, $50 million deep or something like this. I guess even with lending, the borrow asset could be using the aggregator, right? Like it could be, you could be technically borrowing ETH, but then it like, uses aggregated liquidity to get you to, to USDC or something. So I guess the main concern is just the just the price oracle sort of concept, right? I mean, because in my mind, I would think you would want that to be deep because it seems like if you can manipulate that, then you're kind of manipulating how lending is pricing itself. Um, but then the question is, like, how do you actually keep those pools deep if they're not really needed for, for swaps and all of that? Well, the lending design... Uh, it has price manipulation protections built into it that is irrespective to the depth of, of the pools, right? Uh, it doesn't actually matter how, how deep the pool is because it's measuring the price change that you're applying to a particular pool, not so much how much room you spent to do so, or that that, that would be relative to, to, to pool depth, which would be problematic uh, in terms of and that, protection. And that, that's super lit. Like I want to point out, um, I didn't know about that at first and I was just kind of like gaming through it. And, and I was like, Oh, this could be an easy way to attack the system. Yeah. And then Chad explained this to me. And then I realized like, you, you can't do this on Ethereum. You can't do this on Aave. You can't chain link can never do this. Like, no, like it's, 
it's so sick. Like you can only do this on a um, on a Cosmos network, I think. If someone correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but yeah, it's it's one of these things that's like <clears throat> like uh, again, like there's there's even if you wanted to replicate our if even if you decided like oh wow, Thorchain just came out with a really novel lending design, you would not be able to do it on Ethereum or any other um, EVM based chain, to my knowledge, which is crazy. But you have to remember that the that the pools are always manipulable, right? They're just liquidity pools, and anybody can trade any volume they want in any direction of any of the pools, right? And if your if your defense against manipulation is the pools are deep, therefore it's too expensive to attack. Well, that becomes, you know, just depends on how much the the attacker has in, ter in terms of capital, right? If you have a wealthy enough attacker, they can they can spend $2 million on fees to push the Bitcoin price down or push or up, depending on which direction they're trying to go. And then, you know, open up a $10 million loan, or whatever, where they, where they, you know, receive $80 million in, in, in debt. I'm, just, I'm making up random numbers here, but like you can't rely on the pool depths themselves to be your protection because they're always manipulable. You have to start with that assumption because they are, right? So instead of relying on the depth of the pools to protect the network from manipulation, we use just plain out mathematical uh, approach. So it's not really matter how the depths are, it's a question of how much percentage change of the price has been pushed in this pool for the last, you know, 30 minutes. And that's some number. And depending upon how large that number is, is how shallow the, the virtual depth of the drought asset pools are. Okay, that's blowing my mind right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to get my head around this. So, so even if the pool is shallow, if, if the price of that stable coin has moved dramatically, that's what it's factoring in. Like it, it, it's almost like has like an anchor point and it's not about the depth, it's about if it's off from what it was. Yeah, it's looking at the the price change, right, of the of the pool as a percentage, right. It's, if the pool has gone up ten percent, or eighty, let's say say the pool has gone up one hundred and eighty percent in in price in the last thirty minutes, right? Because obviously somebody's manipulating the price at that point, right? <clears throat> like that would cause the virtual pool to become really really shallow for the for the derived asset thing. But if it's just regular trading and it's like 10%, 20%, blah, 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 whatever, then it would be, you know, fairly deep relative to the layer one asset, right? So it's not, it doesn't really matter if the pool is a million dollars deep or a billion dollars deep. The responsiveness that the virtual pool has is the same, right? And so even if you spent less money to create a manipul manipulated situation, manipulate the, 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 the price and therefore make the pool very shallow, the virtual pool very shallow, well, then whatever amount of money that you then blast the lending design to either open or close your loan, depending on which angle you're going at it, you would pay so much in fees because the pool is so shallow that you would pay much more in fees than the cost you spent um, to make the, to manipulate the price. That's, that's, that's the theory at least. I'm curious to see how it ends up working in practice because like I, I can visualize it, but it's, uh, you know, I, I'm curious to see what it looks like when we actually start getting into testing for that. Probably in 2023, starting testing on, on lending in, in stage debt. Pluto. Yeah, I actually, I actually want to do a thing where we, we launch the derived assets in like an offline mode, right, where you can't actually trade with it or do anything, but I just want to watch how the derived asset pool depths shift over time, like give it like a week or two of just normal traffic and normal pools and and see if the virtual pools are staying deep and they're staying very, you know, deep in size and they're not really fluctuating very much. Or is there, is it, you know, is it becoming very shallow because of some trade volume happening that's not malicious, that's just regular trade volume. Uh, and so I actually want to do some experimentation on that because I've come up with a few different implementations of of how we like measure the the amount of effect that the layer one pool has right I have, I have a few different design ideas or implementation ideas and so i'm starting with the one that is the most conservative the one that is the most protective right which might be overly protective which is the thing i'm concerned about at this point but that that's a real possibility which is why i want to test out these derived virtual pool depths in production and just to see what the how the depth change from block to block and just kind of watch it for a while and see if it's 
behaving in a reasonable way or if, it, if it's overly sensitive and it's become really shallow too fast and and, and it basically destroys the ability for lending to exist because all the virtual pools are like really shallow all the time. That just becomes you know counterproductive. But I think if we start with the most conservative approach first, see how it kind of fares, and then adjust if we need to. Yep, best way to do it, I think. Yeah. Anyone from the audience of uh, if questions want to come up on stage? already been at this for like hour 40 already so won't go too much longer but if there's people who want to come up now's probably the time to raise your hand and it's good conversation i don't i don't mind it when these things go along yeah. just because a lot, a lot of times it's just it's like really good conversation you know either myself and pluto are having some discussion or debate about something just it's kind of fun to hear different sides of a view <clears throat> shock rocket hey guys hey uh a question about um sexes set up with savers uh, what that would take um, what kind of timeline that would be if that's being uh, explored uh, stuff like that uh, I mean it's very easy to do if a, if a sex wanted to integrate with savers and provide Bitcoin or other assets whatever it's actually very easy to do <clears throat> so all you have to do is just sign a Bitcoin transaction to, to enter or exit and that's literally the only thing you have to do so uh, I can't imagine it being that difficult. I don't know if Pluto has a different viewpoint than me, but. Are there incentives for sexes to do that? I know there's, you know, for the users, obviously, big incentive. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are on sexes um, that are even being fully aware of the risks of being on a centralized exchange. They're aware of what happened with FTX and all that kind of stuff, uh, still won't leave Kraken, for example. Um, they want to stay on there, but would be thrilled. And I've, I've talked to them about it, about the concepts of lending and saving. They're thrilled with that idea, but still don't want to leave centralized exchange. They don't want to leave Kraken. Um, just because of, one, the work, setting up a new wallet, the risk of making that transaction, keeping track of keys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the risks involved with that. But if they had a, you know, oh, I can just get on the, in my app or the exchange, one click, boom, I'm saving, or one click, boom, I'm lending, they'd be all for it. And I think there's a probably a pretty big audience out there that would be in that same boat. Yeah, so <clears throat> as a centralized exchange, uh, the really kind of two benefits or two reasons why you'd want to integrate with savers. One is savers of, um, uh, of supports affiliate fees. And so with every, every you know, dollar you get put into savers, uh, the, the affiliate or the, the, uh, the sex itself can earn some kind of yield or income, which is you know, incentive for them to do so. Um, the other reason why they would want, want to do that is by being able to, to publish to people about like, oh, you can trade Bitcoin here and also you can get Bitcoin yield. Um, that just draws more capital and revenue into their, you know, system, uh, where they can then, you know, build their build their their business in a literal sense. And so there's there's multiple incentives for them to do so. And I think it's a natural thing to happen that that we'll see a lot of this being used. I mean, like if you, um, like take Nexo, I don't know how much it is now because it's in bear market. But like back when I last time I was talking to them, it was like you know ten or fifteen billion dollars of you know. You know crypto or value or whatever. And they're constantly looking for, you know, ways to generate revenue or ways to generate uh, yield because they, they get a lot of business for just from promising customers like, hey, give us your Ethereum, give us your Bitcoin and we'll, we'll reinvest it for you and we'll, we'll find ways to get generate yield and we'll give you some sort of yield product and you don't have to worry about the mechanics of all that thing or like study different Aave and different products and different DeFi protocols and blah, 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 GBDC and all these things. We'll just take it, abstract it away for you. We'll do the research. We'll do the heart, the legwork, and you just can sit home and, and and get your yield. And so they're constantly looking for ways of getting yield. And and then, and then right before the market went bare, we had a lot of those those entities, such as exchanges um, like like Nexo and BlockFi, and a lot of these services were like very bullish on adding you know LP to Thorchain and all these other ideas. And then the market went bare. A lot of them went out of business. You know, blah blah blah, whatever. But like. Um, there's definitely the drive is there, the demand is there. I think the product that we have is will satisfy a lot of those companies and will naturally make the pools much more deep 
So Thor chain. That just gave me a crazy idea too. Is so the sex, yeah, they obviously have the opportunity to 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 earn an income off of this through the affiliate fee. Um, and hypothetically, like, what if they imposed a lockup period and they're taking a fee in exchange for that? What they're doing is fronting the cost of slippage, and that would be hypothetically really interesting because then the user on a sex in a really simplified environment they would just deposit one Bitcoin and their balance would be one Bitcoin uh, rather than having to have the complexity of understanding like the, the in and out fees. Uh, it just makes me wonder if there's like a way to kind of like have that come from the sex income on the savers to kind of cover that cost for the saver and then uh, just simplify it for them. Yeah, absolutely. You like, could definitely do that with certain amounts. I, I think that'd be interesting, especially for tiers and, and things like that. You know, you, you could you could easily work out the math there for how long it takes to, uh, like, on average, to get this to get the fee back for a certain deposit amount. I think that's a a great idea and something that sexes should definitely look into implementing. Yeah, I think they naturally will. It's kind of a, a no brainer in some ways. As long as they get, I mean, if we learn anything from FTX, they they get permission from their users. And they have our knowledge that that they're <laughs> that they're taking people's Bitcoin and putting it into Thorchain savers. Like, obviously, they can't do that without informing their users. I guess that's I guess that's that's called fraud. <laughs> but yeah, if they tell a user like we're going to provide your Bitcoin into this network into Thorchain to savers and earn you a yield, then you know that's great. And then you're right. Then they can abstract away the fees that are associated with it and just you know just make them disappear for the users and make it even simpler for them. Yeah, I think that'd be super cool because it's like, I mean, obviously, I think Savers is amazing, but that's like one of the things that requires you to be a little bit more understanding like what's actually going on, right? Because you have to understand slippage on the in and out. And if that could be abstracted away, then it's just like the simplest thing ever, right? So it'd be really cool. You could just make it so that way you can't d withdraw it until the user has recouped their original position or, or you could have your own, like, like the sex could have their own position in it. And then user allocation just kind of comes out of that allocation. Like it, it, there's a million different ways you could do it each with like different levels of, uh, of risk that, that, that come with that, I think. But like, yeah, the, there's a lot of different ways to abstract that from the user and make it like a better UX. And, and sexes take huge fees on those types of things typically. Cause there'll be like some, some L1 that like the staking is, nine percent or something and if you deposit on it like through the sex it's like three percent or something right so like they have a ton of margin there um and yep. then if they could use that margin to to just offset all the in and out fees yeah uh, yeah they could totally do that uh and they probably will i mean they'll probably gouge people to your point uh thoreau like you know we're, we're right now it's like we're like a five percent yield on bitcoin right now and they'll promise people like 1% and it'll be like a thousand times more successful than BlockFi ever was. <laughs> Which is almost comical. But yeah, absolutely. Order, you any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, so I guess a year or so ago, I floated the idea of why couldn't we use some of the um, liquidity to run validators to kind of juice the yields. And I think the answer I got back then was uh, churn is a problem. And I wonder if that's still still kind of the, the case or whether we think there's... This is, are you saying using LP units as your bonding asset yeah. instead of instead of room? So use, using, um, let's take like BSC is supposed to come online, right? So rather than just having BSC sitting there waiting to get you know swapped, that if the pools are deep enough, maybe take 25%, and maybe there's some more rules around this about like users depositing and, and locking it up for a certain period of time, <clears throat> but using that to run a BSC validator and, and that, taking the yield from that validator and putting it back into the pool. Uh, well, that would require centralization for the first thing, because somebody has to actually run it, somebody has to be selected to run that thing. And it also would require people's understanding and knowledge that certain percentage of their their you know their LP position is going to be allocated yeah. for this purpose. I guess the idea is, I mean, there would be you know, I don't even, I don't know if it's worth it, but I guess my thinking is that hey, there's capital can it be used uh, again? Like I and I don't know the mechanics of like 
how much how deep into the pools you go at any one time but um i yeah. don't think it's that deep <clears throat> could someone say yeah i'll agree to like keep my capital locked up for one week two weeks a month in exchange for a little extra yield because it's actually being used rather than just sitting there being used to to i guess underscore or underpin a validator bsc eth any proof of stake or delegated proof of stake yeah i mean uh, this to me feels like an overcomplication, and you're also introducing a significant amount of risk because you require centralized energy to be part of it as well as you are now having external dependencies on the thor network which we've never done that before either and for good reason i might add um I mean, if somebody wanted to fork Thorchain and effectively do what you're saying, that'd be an interesting, you know, play, and we'll see if see how yeah. it works out. It was this actually. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it was just like, hey, can we make dual use of capital that are that's sitting there, and is it worth it? Uh, this reminds me of an idea that was coming up um, when when Terra was integrated. I remember some people were pushing for, I think it was called X Luna to be a pool, and because X Luna was basically like staked a staked representation of Luna and, and similar even for like the atom pool, like one reason that uh, Thorchain atom liquidity could like, isn't as deep as it could be is because people want the yield they can get and the airdrops they can get elsewhere with the atom. So it's like an interesting concept. I think it does add uh, like another layer of risks because then you're dealing with not really the true native asset, but some other asset, but you, yeah, maybe, maybe a fork is the way to go for that. Like a, like a Thorchain of, yield bearing assets kind of interesting yeah i mean, I, mean, I think there's this, a weird fixation that, that the crypto community in general has around like double dipping assets and the idea that i can take an asset and then get a yield an asset and then take some derivative of that asset to get another yield an asset and then do it again a third or fourth time it's just like like that it to me feels fundamentally broken and that you, you can't just take a hundred dollars and get yield on a five thousand dollars just because you know whatever. I mean you can that's called leverage and people do that, but um that just to me feels like I don't know, way too yeah, it's, risky. It's the elephant meme. Do you remember the elephant meme? No, which one's that? <laughs> I'll have to send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure somebody remembers it. Yeah, somebody, somebody shoot me a link to that elephant meme because I'd be curious about it. But like, I, I've, I've had friends who, who did this, you know, like I got a good friend of mine who's like kind of a degen and he, he kind of like, there's a lot of like crypto style gambling kind of thing. And he just, he just like puts himself through so many loops of like risk to get some crazy high yield on some crazy asset or whatever, uh, that he just like, he just ends up wrecking himself <laughs> oftentimes. Like he would, like he just gets exposed to so many DeFi protocols. It's only a matter of time before one of them is just like emptied, because I, you know that's a common thing to happen in in crypto in general, right? Is DeFi pro products become emptied. yeah. I, 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 that. Um, I don't know. I feel this is slightly less risky because you're running like an L1 validator, like for Ethereum. Like yeah, that's true. Like that's yeah. not gonna that's not gonna collapse in a sense outside of the context of. That person who run, actually runs the validator decides to yoink and, and run away. Yeah. It feels like as long as it's the assets secured, like the node operator can't run away with it without paying a price. Um, I don't know. It feels, feels like there's something there, but may, maybe I'm wrong. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, as long as it does not make a compromise on security and, and like all these kind of things, which it sounds like it would. It would require trust, it would create more new points of centralization. It require like deals being made between you know I don't even know who's making this. Is it some sort of DAO or the, the validators electing Hoder to be the validator for Binance Smart Chain or Atom or whatever the thing is? Well, I, like, I'm just node operators are running nodes anyway, right? It would just be about adding a bond, uh, an ETH bond. I don't know the details of ETH. Um, yeah, but adding you know adding actual ETH to that and saying hey go run this anyway. You're you're gonna do it, and then when it, Funds migrate, you know, migrate the funds to the new address, establish a new validator, get pulled in. And... Yeah, yeah. I just, I just feel that stuff gets very unstable very quickly. Like, Osmosis right. does something similar to that, where they have this like super fluid staking, which they're quite proud of as a community. But like to me, just the whole concept is just like void of any rationale 
like the idea that I can provide bond and then get a yield on that, even though I'm not providing any value or service because I'm because I'm, I'm a delegate, and then get something else to be able to, to provide something to something else to get more yield on that. It's just like it's just, it just it, the elephant uh, meme that that Chad threw us at me. Just it just it feels like that. It's an elephant sucking its own dick with its own trunk. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what? Just, <laughs> He sent me the link. It, like, the meme is it's a it's a blue elephant with his trunk going between his legs and sucking his own dick. That's what the that's what the meme is, right? Let's, yeah, let's, let's be adults here. Come on, people. Let's be adults here. Come on. <laughs> and it's it's a perpetual, perpetual money machine. It's a perpetual money machine of just like an elephant sucking its own dick. Which you can't you have to remember that like in order for you to make money, to make a yield, you cannot do it from sucking your own dick, okay? It doesn't work that way. You have to get somebody else to inject something of value into your system. If there's no money, if there's no exogenous capital, there's no yield to be made. <laughs> yeah, it, it, everyone needs to realize that any any staking design that basically just allows you to just stake somewhere and to receive some yield on it, it is literally just saying, let's take, let's take tokens out of the circulating supply, lock them up, and then, so there's less of a circulating supply so that it looks like the market cap is lower. So more people buy the token so that I, can, I, as the founder of this project, can go dump on all those idiots who staked early on. That's literally all staking is. Yeah, that's the reason why it exists is because it gives everybody a warm, fuzzy feeling that they're getting a yield on their, on their atom tokens or whatever it might be. In reality, it's just like everybody's just licking their own nutsack and not even realizing it. Gavin, I swear, I promise. Well said. It, I, this this whole call has not been like this. I I, I see. <laughs> our, 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 our Popped in at the best time. Uh, no comment. Just just. No, 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 no. <laughs> this one has been a little bit more unhinged because we you know it's like screw it. These are all the Discord OGs, so we're just gonna kind of like YOLO some crazy ideas out on this call. But yeah, this has been a fun one. I know we're yeah, talking is... about elephants and fellatio here, Gavin. It's a very serious topic, okay? We're having a very serious conversation. <laughs> no, no comment. Where's HR when you need HR? Thoreau, where's HR? <laughs> is there a Thorchain HR department? The, well, maybe there should be with my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chad, the last Discord stage, I don't think I told you this, but I think the, uh, the fuck counter was at 88 for the last Discord <laughs> stage on lending. I should hold back more than I do. I actually have to censor nah, the, we love uh, it. the transcripts to be uploaded because Pacebin does not like profanity. So I have to really? manually go in and take out all of your uh, <laughs> all of your curses. Yep. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I make your life so difficult, Kyle. Yep. Yeah, yes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness, I got to hop to another call. But just it was it was a really productive call today. We discussed a lot of topics. Obviously, the trust wallet integration was huge. We talked about synths, we talked about removing ILP, we talked about lending, we threw around some ideas about how, you know, increasing bond providers, we talked about being able to stake to POL. Um, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of interesting ideas, a lot of really, really great things. I'm obviously just regurgitating alpha here because my boss is on stage and year end reviews are coming up. So <laughs> great job, everyone, great job. It doesn't all... Elephant Felicio, it, it was other topics as well as, as Pluto was lining up for himself. <laughs> All right, guys. This is fun. I'll, uh, I got to jump now. But, um, All right. Yeah. See you, Pluto. See you, Pluto. Yeah. So next week, All we right, should now, have that guy. Uh, we can talk about your end reviews. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that Pluto yeah. guy, man. He shouldn't get bonuses at all. I'm telling you right now, that Pluto guy. <laughs> Pluto was talking about elephants for like two hours almost. I know, the whole time. <laughs> all, we, all we were talking about was just elephant fellatios. Uh, so, so next week we should have that guy, Togrul, uh, Mar I, I should have pronounced his last name before I tried to say it live right there. But uh, Togrul from scroll.io, we should be on next week. The, the guy who we were talking to yesterday in conjunction with uh, the... Solana person, so they, they should be on next week. Maybe we'll have a, a, a interesting conversation about that on on the spaces next week. And the week after that is like like right between the holidays. So I think we're gonna probably take that week off for spaces. But yeah, next week we should have something interesting. Uh, some people from the outside of Thorchain probably like coming in and uh, you know us talking about the 
core design a little bit more. Yeah, I look forward to that one. Should be a fun one. Yeah, I know fun. the I know the invite was extended to Anatoly, the co-founder of Solana. Uh, we'll see if he actually takes the bait on that or not. He won't. He won't take the bait on that one. Yeah, he he, he's not coming. There's there's no way. <laughs> he know he knows not to stand in front of an audience of you know another chain and start shitting on it. He knows enough not to do that. <laughs> Especially Brian's when Pellegrino didn't argue just a week. Well, Brian is Brian. Brian, Brian is, I guess, in some sense, he's like he's a new, he's new to the space in some ways. Like he's a new leader in a sense. Like, like uh, Anatoly understands. Like he, he's. Does anyone else hear this or? You can hear me. Yeah, you went. You went robot voice there. Maybe just repeat the last ten seconds. Oh, sorry about that. Um, like Anatoly's been around for a while. He's been a part of a project that's that's had you know big ups and big downs, and and like he's been burned just from the process of running a, a network like this. And we all, those of us who have done it, know you know how he feels, and and it's it's you know, it's no fun sometimes. And so like he knows not to like throw shade and shit on other people, for the most part. Even in this case of what he was saying on Twitter, like his argument was just like this weird thing of like, well, if all the computers are exploited, then all, all the money is lost. I'm like, well, yeah, it's true with like every computer system on the fucking planet. Like if I break into your house and steal your shit, like, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's, you're broke. That's, <laughs> you're broke, man. Like it, 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 it was like, oh, but your, your house isn't, sec- isn't secure because if somebody breaks into your house and, and can steal everything, then you, then you lose everything. It's like, well, yeah, that's how houses work. Yeah, That's... if there's a bank vault with 20 different doors and you have all 20 keys and the guard is sleeping, can you get up with all the money? Yeah. yeah basically, what, basically how it went. Yeah, I was like, if if you if I have your Solana keys, Anatoly, then I have your Solana, right? <laughs> yeah. And he was saying, as well, you can't sign transactions because blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, it doesn't even matter. Like, I can still, if I have all the Solana keys, I can move soul from Chad Thoreau's wallet into mine without requiring his signature. I can do the hell I want. It's my network now. I can really change. I am God. I have God mode here. I've, I can go full goblin mode on this chain and do any of the, any of the things I want to do that I can imagine because I can deploy any changes to the network that I want that I want to deploy. So it's just like, it's a silly argument. And I think he at some level he knows that and he knows not to stand in front of an audience of people and, and stand by a silly argument. So... Well, I think his point is just like it's not nothing is infallible, and like yeah, if there is like a remote code execution, like exploit, and all the validators, like yeah, that is a huge concern. But like obviously, like that right. that's the case for any any network, like literally any network, right? right? So, and that's one of the things I tweeted to him. I said like you know, th- no system is perfect, and Torchain is by far the best we have. It's as simple as that. Yeah, so I, I doubt there's any any way that he comes on, but we are trying, and it would be great. I, I do think it was kind of weird that they put that in the Blockworks coverage from yesterday, but I think that's just part of the, the topical uh, style of more, more reporting clicks. nowadays. Yeah, just more clicks, more downloads, or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of. I, I I do feel kind of bad about that because it, do, it does feel I, I, like at this point it's like, oh yeah, it feels like you know we kind of baited him into that, but it's his own fault, so he's, he's got to live with that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He, he started. Most, I didn't think uh, I had no intention of making it into the article with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it sucks. Like you, if you're like a high profile person, like like CZ, for example, you can't just say whatever you want because people literally look at every single one of your tweets and like you know analyze it and you know think all these all these things about it. Like it's it, it's got to be an incredibly tough position being like so visible, especially as like that. The, the founder of like a huge like retail network like that where there's like you know all these people like constantly looking at you it, it, when you're in the zeitgeist like that i'm sure it's a very different game so yeah i remember andre Conj- yeah. said the same thing where like he he built a twitter account that was super popular had like lots of followers like very quickly very fast and he was saying how much he hated it after a while just because like every time he said something about some project no matter like what it was said like people would jump all over him or misconstrue his statements or whatever this kind of thing so it's like it's like the more powerful you get in the twitter sphere and the more followers you have is like the more respect you have to have for the for that power yeah i think that's something that we need to like also be practicing too because as we put get pushed more into like the central zeitgeist which is kind of which which is the way that, that things are are trending and moving like we need to be more um 
careful about that, especially like like bandwagoning and and things like that. Uh, you know, like I mean, I, I do this all the time where it's like someone mentions something about like, oh, you know, where can I swap like th- these two things or whatever, and then you know, re- retweet, and then all the all the door chats come on, right? And it, like it it is kind of um, it is bandwagoning at some at some point. So it's like just balancing that, and making sure that like you know we're not um, you know taking our like position in the and that's like guys like too too seriously or, or anything or actually t- taking it more seriously and just being more just being respectful to, towards everybody is just important because you know at, at some point people do like pick up on on your every move and if you know right. w- w- when we get to that point we just got to be careful about it I'll yeah say. and also when somebody doesn't understand the importance of Thorchain instead of just kicking them in the balls, uh, you know, take that as an opportunity to, to explain it and educate them. And, you know, sometimes stuff on Twitter can seem like somebody's talking shit or fudding and they're actually just confused or unaware. So a lot of those are opportunities to get new Thorch ads. That's true. It's true. All right. Anything else, guys? I think yeah, we're good. That was a wrap great conversation. All right, guys. Thanks for jumping on. Talk to you next week. Sweet. See you next week. Bye-bye. See you guys.